This is going to be 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we're going to look at the subject of being unashamed. If you're a Christian, there's some things that you shouldn't be ashamed of. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. So number one, you should be unashamed of the preacher. Paul is a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher according to the will of God. As he says in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 11, in this same chapter we're studying, he says, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Of the Gentiles. He's a preacher who preaches the gospel. He is an apostle to the Gentiles. Apostle because he saw the Lord Jesus Christ in his resurrected body. He's a teacher because he has milled revealed many mysteries to the body of Christ. And something that goes along with all these things is that people will hate him. Even to this day, you have people who say that the Apostle Paul shouldn't even be in the Bible. But if you have a Bible-believing preacher who you sit under, then don't be ashamed of him no matter what people say about him. You should be unashamed of your preacher if he's a Bible-believer. And in the same chapter that we're studying... Skip all the way down to verse 8, where Paul says, Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. So Paul is a prisoner for preaching and teaching the gospel. And Second Timothy is his last epistle because he is about to be put to death. And like I said, people hate him. And there may come a day when someone wants to kill your preacher. And Paul says in Galatians 4, 16, Am I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. People just don't want the truth. And if you tell the truth, they're going to see you as their enemy. But thank God if you have a pastor who preaches against adultery and gossip and lust, <clears throat> against transgender bathrooms, thank God if you have a preacher who is against the LGBT stuff. Thank God if your preacher believes in separation from the world. He's not your enemy. He's the world's enemy. So when they say, is that your preacher? Don't be ashamed. There was some people that turned away from Paul, even though he was the main, the one main guy that the Lord was using at that time. In 2 Timothy 1.15, it says, This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. So Paul has to name some names at times. Your preacher may have to name some names and warn you of certain people who are dividing the body of Christ. False prophets, infiltrators, Jesuits, backstabbers, and whoever else. But a preacher who preaches the Bible will have whole areas and locations turned away from him. But even though he has some people that hate him, he has a lot of people who love him. That's the thing about a good preacher. He has a bunch of followers who know he's giving them the Bible. And then he has a bunch of haters who hate his guts. And Paul says in verse 16 of this chapter we're studying, 2 Timothy chapter 1, he says, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. So are you going to be a Onesiphorus or a Phygelus and Hermogenes? Onesiphorus was not ashamed of his chain. He wasn't ashamed that he was chained up in prison for the gospel. One of these days, your pastor may have a mug shot for preaching righteousness. Are you going to see him? Are you going to go see him and refresh him and possibly end up right in there with him? Or are you going to be a phygelus? In 2 Timothy 1.17 it says, But when he was in Rome... When Onesiphorus was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. So Onesiphorus wanted to be a blessing to Paul. He wanted to refresh Paul to the point that he sought him out very diligently and found him. And Paul says in verse 18, The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. So how about that? You get the mercy of God for helping a brother in Christ. 
just being there for him. Now back to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. So the life you need is in Jesus Christ because he is the way, the truth, and the life. In 1 John 5.12 it says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So Paul preached, and he preached where to get life. And it wasn't in money or in worldly prosperity. It was in the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't be ashamed of your preacher. And next, don't be ashamed of your converts. In 2 Timothy 1.12, it says to Timothy, My dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So grace is God giving you something you don't deserve. Mercy is God keeping you from something that you do deserve. And you saw both of those things when you received Jesus Christ. And now you need them every day just to help you get through the day. Not for salvation, you're already saved. But you just need it to get through the day. The, no, the next word is peace. You got peace with God at salvation. Now every day you need the peace of God that passes all understanding. This comes through close fellowship through Bible reading and prayer. So Paul says grace, mercy, and peace to you. To Timothy. So, verse 2, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul led Timothy to the Lord. And although he didn't accept the title of father, he was Timothy's spiritual father. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4.15, For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So, when you... Show someone the gospel and they get saved, you in a sense become their spiritual father, even though you don't take that title. He wasn't ashamed to follow up on his convert, Timothy, and lead him in the right direction. And when you get saved, you need guidance. When someone gets saved, they aren't always acting like a saint overnight. They still have rough edges from a sinful lifestyle they were living before. So don't be ashamed to spend time with them or even write them a letter like Paul did Timothy who was a convert of his from a while back. In verse 3 it says, I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Notice that Paul had a pure conscience. Even though as a lost man he compelled men to blaspheme. This shows you can have victory over sin from your past life and be able to pray to God without those things on your conscience. Paul has a pure conscience, even after all the wicked things that he did in his old lifestyle. And Paul remembers Timothy night and day, even though Timothy is out of sight, but he doesn't put him out of mind. Paul doesn't forget to pray for his convert. He's not ashamed of his convert. And Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 7, to pray without ceasing. Prayer is something you can do anytime. You can be praying and no one even knows about it. It's a good way to redeem the time. You can pray as you're working or while you're in the break room. And nobody would even know that you're doing it. But Paul thanks a lot of Timothy. He even spent time to write two epistles to him that ended up being in the Bible. In verse 4 it says, Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. So Paul knows what he believes. And he's sure of it. However, he still gets along with many other saints and even desires to see them. This can be harder for some than others. For someone who's so sure about what they believe, it can be hard for them to be around others because people are going to disagree with them. Some saints are more loners than others. But Paul was desiring to be with other saints. Also notice he was mindful of his tears. And nothing wrong with a Christian man crying. Jesus wept. Uh, a man shouldn't down another man for crying. You know that saying, real men don't cry. That's not a real saying. Because Paul cried. Jesus cried. Men in the Bible cried. So a man shouldn't down another man for crying. Because Paul says here, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. Timothy was a crier. Paul was a crier. Paul was mindful of Timothy's tears. Jesus wept. Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. 
you know, all the, the men in the Bible cried. And then you have Bible-believing fathers of the faith. In 2 Timothy 1.3, it says, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. So if the forefathers were the ones you read about in the Old Testament, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Paul was of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul wasn't ashamed of them. He speaks of Abraham and David in Romans 4. He acknowledges of where he came from. Just like you shouldn't be ashamed of your Christian background. If you are a Bible believer, then you came from a long line of great saints. All the way back to, from Jesus Christ and the apostles. And men who died for the word of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. They were burned at the stake and went through torments all because they were Christians. And these are the people you will spend eternity with. That's your Christian background that you shouldn't be ashamed of. Also, don't be ashamed of the ones who actually raised you to be a Bible-believing Christian. If you look at verse 5 in 2 Timothy chapter 1, it says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. So Timothy's grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice obviously trained him up to be a Bible-believing Christian. As it says in Proverbs 22, 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. They obviously taught Timothy the words of God, because as it says in this same book we're studying in 2 Timothy 3, 15, it says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So, Timothy obviously had a good grandmother and a good mother who led him down the right road. And growing up, I was lost, but my grandparents would always show me the right way. They told me the gospel and constantly warned against this present evil world. So it had an effect on me. And if you had parents like that, it has an effect on you. Growing up, it didn't seem like it was helping me. But I may be a bit more of a fanatic now than they were. I may be more of a fanatic now than I would have been had they not told me all that stuff. So just because it doesn't seem like it's working now, that stuff's getting in your child's head. We're living in a time when mothers and grandmothers aren't worth very much. They never grew up. They're still more concerned with looking young. And they're concerned with their men and having a, a man crush Monday. And they don't want to take care of their kids and be a mother. They would rather go hang out with the girls or something. While most men today are selfish and care more about their hobbies and their job than they do about being a father and a husband. Or they just are flat out lazy deadbeats who won't get their carcass off the couch and go to work. People are just lousy. And they're not training up their child in the way he should go. Do you know how much better a man's kids would be if the man wasn't a man whore and he was faithful to his wife and he was a good example to his son? Do you know how much better a son would be if his mother wasn't a man-chasing whore and was faithful to her husband and taught her children the holy scriptures? But one of the main things wrong with kids is their low-down, deadbeat parents who don't want their kids because they are still kids in their mind themselves. All the music they listen to and the people they hang out with have stunted their growth and it's made them still act like a bunch of teenagers even though they're 40, 50 years old. But thank God for good parents like Eunice and Lois, Timothy's mother and grandmother. And it doesn't mention Timothy's father who was a Greek. Maybe he was a lost man. But we need families with good mothers and good fathers, not fathers and fathers, not mothers and mothers. That is sick. What kids need is a mother who acts like a mother and a father who acts like a father who will train them up in the way they should go. And you shouldn't be ashamed of where you came from. You shouldn't be ashamed of your Christian background. All the Bible believers that went on before you, you shouldn't be ashamed of your parents who have a Christian background. And next, you shouldn't be ashamed to witness. In verse 7 in 2 Timothy chapter 1, it says, For God hath given us the spirit of for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 
So don't be ashamed or afraid to witness. That feeling of fear you get before you witness to someone isn't from God. That spirit of fear you get when you saw a horror movie wasn't from God. And looking at Paul's life, it looked like he was fearless. He had already been to heaven and back. He knew what was waiting for him on, on the other side. So he wasn't at all afraid of shipwrecks and being stoned and beaten with rods. He may have even had a death wish a little bit. And he said, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Sometimes we are af afraid, then other times we are bold. When reading the life of David, you can see where he was fearless against Goliath, then other times he was scared to death. But God doesn't want you afraid. He's not afraid, and he's in you. He has given us power. If you've got Jesus Christ in you, then you shouldn't be afraid. But this power that he's given you is connected with the scriptures. In Matthew twenty-two twenty-nine, it says, Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. The gospel is the power of God in Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the gospel is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We can stand in it and we're kept by it. And that power is in us, so why should we be afraid? 1 Peter 1, 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith and to salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. If you're kept by the power of God, why are you fearful of losing your salvation? We have power because the Almighty is within us. He has given us the Word of God, which, which has power, and the gospel itself is called the power of God. And this is what you are bearing witness of that is true, and you're trying to persuade others to believe it. So don't be ashamed of this power when you witness. And the bloody death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the gospel, and that's where the power is at. Verse 8 says, Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. So don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Paul wasn't ashamed to go around and say, Jesus Christ is the Son of God who lived a sinless life, to die on the cross and a bloody death for your sins and to be buried and resurrected. So don't be ashamed of that. Revelation 19.10 says, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the, that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Don't be ashamed to prophesy and say to another that if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then you will burn in hell forever. That is the Bible truth, and there's power in those words. And if you do this enough, then you will be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. And people will not like you just like they didn't like Paul. Now Acts 5.41 says, And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. They weren't afraid to witness. So don't be afraid to witness, and don't be ashamed to witness. Don't be Next, don't be ashamed of how you get saved. Don't feel bad because you didn't earn it. You know you didn't earn your salvation. You got it one way, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed of that. Don't be so prideful. Jesus earned it for you. All credit goes to Him. None goes to you, and if you're saved, then don't be ashamed of that fact. 2 Timothy 1 9 says, Who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Notice the saving goes before the calling. Someone may say that God calls who he will save, but the verse said he saved us and called us. It put the saving first. And notice it says, which was given us in Christ Jesus. You see, God knew man would sin and that Jesus Christ would have to die. And he chose to save anyone who chose to get in Jesus Christ by believing on Jesus Christ. It was all an act of free will. It was already settled that God would save anyone who got in Christ Jesus. But God didn't determine on his own who would get in Christ Jesus. He left it up to the individual. Also notice in verse 9 it says that the saving and the calling wasn't according to works. Over and over, Paul shows us that salvation is by grace through faith 
without works, meaning you can't do anything good enough to get saved, and you can't do anything bad enough that makes you lose the opportunity to get saved. And after salvation, you can't do anything good enough to keep it, and you can't do anything bad enough to lose it. God keeps you. A changed life doesn't prove you're saved. A changed life proves you're putting down the flesh. And I, I shouldn't look for fruit to determine if a person is saved. I look for fruit to determine if that is someone I need to fellowship with. So don't be ashamed of how you get saved. Through Christ, that's how you get saved, of your own free will, not of works. And also don't be ashamed of the one who did the saving, the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 10 in 2 Timothy 1, it says, But now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So when Jesus Christ appeared on the scene, they denied him, they rejected him, they hated him, and God purpose to come down in the flesh and down the cross for all the sins of mankind and through his death he got rid of death when resurrected he had victory over death and we get victory when we believe on him he brought life and immortality to light through the gospel and what's the gospel the death burial and resurrection how jesus died on the cross for your sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures and just as sure it is that jesus rose from the dead it is that sure that my body will be resurrected and that death will have no hold on me. I may die physically one day before the rapture, but no grave can hold us down. Now verse 11, Paul says, Where I am too, I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. And Paul isn't ashamed to be a preacher of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, or to be an apostle or to be a teacher of of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, he preached Jesus with boldness, persuading the men to make decisions to turn to Jesus Christ. He preached to safe people, getting them to remember Jesus Christ. He was an apostle, a sent one. He was a teacher. He made known the sense of the mysteries and the words of God. He was primarily to the Gentiles, just like a missionary's primary ministry is to, to the country they went to. But Paul still had a burden for his kinsmen according to the flesh, the Jewish people. And he preached the cross of Christ to every creature. And he says in verse 12, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. He knows he has believed in Jesus Christ and he wasn't ashamed of it. He was fully persuaded that he couldn't get out of Christ Jesus. He couldn't get out of the body. As he says in Romans 8, 38 through 39, he's persuaded in that. Abraham was fully persuaded in Romans 4, 21 about the promise of God. And Paul was fully persuaded that he was going to heaven, and not only that, but he was persuaded that God is able to keep that which he had committed unto him against that day, that day that's coming in the future. And the Lord Jesus Christ knows who's in him. He knows who's saved. And Paul knew he was saved. He had assurance. And next, don't be ashamed of the Bible itself. In 2 Timothy 1.13, it says, Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. And you can't hold fast the words if you don't have the words. Many men think that we don't have the words. We have all these different versions of the Bible, but only one of them can be right because they all say something different. There is only one that is right, and that is the King James Bible. Paul believed it, and so did Timothy. And in 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul said to Timothy, And that from a child that has known the Holy Scriptures. So Paul knew the Scriptures he had held in his hand were holy. And those Scriptures he held were not the original copy that was written down. It was a copy of copies of copies that shows me he believed that god can preserve his word through copies throughout time and never let it be ha having error in it so if you ha hold fast the form of sound words then you're going to stick with the book the king james bible so hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in christ jesus in faith because you're not going to change it and in love because you can't put it down let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand, as it says in Psalms 149.6. Be like Eliezer, one of David's mighty men. In 2 Samuel 23.10 it says, He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave into the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. So your hand needs to cleave unto the word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So read it 
until the gold gilding begins to fade. Mark it until the pages crinkle up. Write in it until you can't fit anything else in the margins. Ruckman said one time that thumb prints on the Bible are worth a million times more than footprints on the moon. The Bible has a lot more in it than the moon has on it. Don't be ashamed to be a King James Bible believer and to say that the other versions are out of hell, even though the greatest scholars like the new versions. The King James Bible is for us. Next, don't be ashamed of the Holy Spirit of God. In verse 14, it says, That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. So if you're saved, then you have Christ in you, the hope of glory, according to Colossians 1.27. And it says in Acts 17, 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven on earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. God dwells in you. The Holy Spirit is in you. He goes where you go. Everywhere you go, you take him with you. And don't be ashamed to do the things that he tells you to do in this Bible. Don't be ashamed to go to the places that he tells you to go and stay away from the places that he tells you not to go. Uh, he's the comforter. And how crazy is it that that God lives in you even though you are a, a, a dirty vessel. You're a sinful creature and it's a mystery that God chose to dwell in you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's a mystery. So don't be ashamed of these things. And if you're not saved, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection to pay for your sins. But this has been a study on 2 Timothy chapter number 1.